Hello. Hey, this is Anna. Hi, Anna. Uh, hello. How, how are you? Hey. I am well. <laughs> I, I came prepared. <laughs> Yay. I have a little bit of kombucha left in my glass, but when that's done, I have my little mini. Oh, nice. Bottle. Ready we're gonna to... we're gonna simulate the pop <laughs> yeah yeah you know because it has like the little screw top for the uh -huh. ball. so it was like I couldn't I didn't remember that and I was like trying to wiggle off the like the plastic casing that goes over the the screw top and I'm like yeah. oh it's gonna pop and then I'm, oh it's just it's just this on top is. of a metal <laughs> I know. metal thing anyway well i'm glad that you're free to do Yay. this i know it's like yes. late in uh are you here in um eastern time zone i, I am hunkering down in boston oh which yeah seemed, seemed like a better place to uh spend the apocalypse <laughs> at least if it's you know not not being able to go outside and stuff but yeah. uh it, it's crazy i mean I'm, I'm sure it is for you as well but like this my my phone app uh, the the delta app has never been this empty it's Doubt oh yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah we grunted everybody last week basically as i was coming back into the country and you know for us it's it's kind of okay because we're location like as a company but some of our clients had literally had to like they learned about docusign and things like that so it's a little you know magical to introduce yeah. that kind of stuff i mean it is right there's there's like obviously you know the human scale of this is is tragic and mm -hmm. and important and we need to be thinking that way but i but i think there are some some ways in which like uh, oh i sorry i just got a text from my friend mm -hmm. tara six more minutes oh no worries <laughs> <laughs> okay uh there are some ways in which i think you know we we could come out of this with new skills and new clarity and all that stuff so i'm excited about that aspect of it it's uh it, it's hard to kind of not get excited about the scale of the human experiment now because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we so rarely experience something simultaneously anymore. Like, right. short of sports, there really aren't that many events that everybody kind of tunes in for at the yeah. same time. And this is, in so many places, it's more or less the same experience. Everybody's cooped up and everybody's dealing with similar challenges with the underlying threat of death and you know yeah. despair yeah um, but I, I i'm i'm hopeful <laughs> i think that you know when this is over we'll we'll come out of it um having accelerated some conversations that would probably take forever otherwise yeah um, yeah agreed and it does seem like a lot of people are connecting the dots with the climate change conversation yes which... also it's like day three or four so maybe let's have this conversation again on like day 14 and see if we've gone loopy by then but... it's so funny because you know it's day three or four for for some folks yeah and obviously you know folks in wuhan uh were having mm -hmm. this like you know months ago yeah. um but but i think i was saying this in a group that i'm part of that everybody reaches their their threshold I think at a different moment and yeah. once you hit that threshold it's like everything is completely clear about what's about to happen and so for me that was weeks ago mm -hmm. that you know I think just to, and I would imagine this is probably true for you too that one of the aspects of my work and my my career mm -hmm. is that I'm pretty good at pattern recognition and yeah. and you know so you sort of you read up, you see all this stuff happening, and it's like, well, I mean, this is this is really happening, and yeah. there the math is there, and it doesn't, you know, you get you can have naysayers, you know, talking about, uh, well, you know, the flu is a much bigger set of numbers or whatever. It's like, yeah, now, mm -hmm. <laughs> but just wait, <laughs> and you yeah. know, there's there's a lot of attributes that are just not it's apples and oranges to talk about that, but but when I so when I had that panic moment weeks ago. It was like I got it over and done, and now yeah. now I'm looking at the rest of this timeline as like it's just inevitable. That's what we're dealing with, and so the the sooner everybody else catches up to that panic moment and then the reality after, the the more we're going to be able to deal with this with eyes wide open. So I'm glad yeah. that people are hitting that threshold, but it's weird for me because I feel like weeks ago I was like, when are people going to start seriously, you know, taking this seriously? I think it's hard to spot if you 
you know, don't have that international purview if you're not constantly in different places and, yeah, and seeing how, how different places normally work. Yeah. Like, you know, knowing what it takes to, you know, close down Wuhan. Right. I had a conversation with somebody who, you know, was uh, literally imagining Wuhan to be like a small pastoral fishing village. Mm-hmm. And, and that kind of blew my mind. Like, wow, we, we, we're dealing with orders of magnitude difference in, in you know, understanding of what's really happening here right off the bat. And right. so I think a lot of it felt very, in, at least initially, felt like it was very far away and like not something that should necessarily concern you. And when you look at, you know, miles or a globe, that seems to be the case, but mm-hmm. it really ignores how interconnected we are for even the most basic things today. Yeah. And so I think, you know, you and I, by virtue of, of what we're working on daily, are, are very much attuned into that interconnectedness. So for us, uh, patterns like that is easy to see. But uh, for other people in other professional disciplines, it might not necessarily be the case. And, and I, right. feel like, I feel insanely privileged on the one hand side to, to be able to have that kind of a, somewhat of a calm reaction. Like, yeah, you know, we, maybe we, we had a few weeks warning. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's really frightening to see discrepancies in responses. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like my, uh, my family, my parents are in Serbia where they declared um, essentially martial law. So people mm-hmm. over 65 cannot leave the house at all under threat of arrest. And, uh, you know, and, and they went and bought like two pounds of potatoes. This was their planning. So, wow. <laughs> so <Wow. laughs> yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, looks like we got Tara. I'm I'm here. Uh, here we go. Let's see if I can. Hey. Yeah. Hey. 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 <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Tara, Anna, Anna, Tara. Nice to meet you. Hi, Anna. Nice to meet you. Hello, hello. And I think we're still expecting Bronwyn. Uh, so we'll. Uh, she's in South Africa, though. I think so. I don't know if uh, you know she's. If she's really going to be able to swing it with time difference, or, oh. or but yeah, we'll see. Okay. So well, uh, well, I know we said this was wine and privacy, but it's St. Patrick's Day, so right. here I am. Cheers. Cheers. I I have a couple of potatoes in the in the uh, kitchen too, in case we want to bust those out. So we. Can- <laughs> Potatoes. <laughs> I've, I'm in Boston, and it is the quietest St. Patrick's Day ever. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Like nobody yeah. is on the streets. Everything is closed, uh, and it, it's just eerie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't actually been outside today, <laughs> which oh. <laughs> you know isn't really that unusual for me when I'm working from home. <laughs> so and that's not that that surprising. But you know, being that it's St. Patrick's Day, and actually, come to think of it, it's not that unusual for a St. Patrick's Day because <laughs> New York is just such a <laughs> yes. amateur. Yeah, it's hour. the last place you want to be is out in that public. So, Anna, tell me, tell me about you. I since we just met. Sure. Uh, so I run a management consultancy uh, called Sparrow Advisors, and we may- mainly focus on ad tech, martech, e-commerce, and like the <sighs> fast, fast digital spaces. Um, oh, and, good. And, One and of their the environs. <laughs> complicated areas there is when it comes to figuring out how privacy law applies. So In, Indeed. And also the one area where a lot of this stuff is piloted and the one area where we tend to turn a blind eye towards things like privacy and interpret it as, you know, something optional yeah and i i do not subscribe to that <laughs> to that view <laughs> no I, 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 everything here you tell me is you know confidential today <laughs> so, yes, this is the, 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 the cone i'm not of, here to bust anybody the cone of <laughs> confidentiality bestowed upon us by saint patrick himself <laughs> yes <laughs> aside from the fact that i'm recording and planning on publishing <laughs> oh no <laughs> i made a huge mistake <laughs> yeah well saint patrick also gave us the gift of gab right yeah so. Indeed, yes. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you um in this whole horrible situation there have been a couple of things that made me laugh and one was that a uh, church somewhere had to replace their uh, a holy water repository with uh, hand sanitizer, and I, and I oh. thought that was that was a perfect illustration of the kinds of trade-offs that we need to wow. make, where we're still kind of well. Uh, of course, we need the ceremonial um, aspects of holy water, 
but we're just going to use hand sanitizer because it's well, more practical that way. Yeah. <laughs> the the last oh. time I set foot in my church, it was um, the holy water urn was empty. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of how they're they're dealing with it right now. People are <laughs> making their <laughs> sacrifices. I'm going to. But see is this is the hand sanitizer blessed? I, I, I do not know. I have I so many is. questions about that. I bet that. it is. I want to yeah. know. Yeah. No, I'm... <laughs> it seems like an important detail. <laughs> right? And, and it could be like, is, do we just stick with this moving forward? Because it right. seems like an upgrade, right? Yeah, um, actually it does, right? Like, I mean, everybody comes into the, like you do when you come into the church, right? Or yes. when you're about to yes. leave. And so you've yes. had, you're, you're coming in, you've had a lot of outside interactions, or mm -hmm. you're leaving after you've had a lot of inside interactions. Yeah. It makes so much sense. Yeah. So, yay, upgrades. <laughs> yeah, that's a good upgrade. Uh, there we go. Holy hand sanitizer. I'm going to improve the audio here. <laughs> I love that we're all camp over the year. Yeah, you know, I tried I tried doing um, my snowball mic, uh, uh, uh -huh. and it just didn't sound very good. So I was like, eh, it, mm -hmm. this is cash. We're doing a cash thing. It turns out my in-ear ones are, um, are my, you know, the new ones for the phone and there's no jack on the computer for that. So like, that's, yes, mm -hmm. this is Apple improving our lives here. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. so that's my big theme, you know, it's like how, hmm. how tech can be used to improve human life. And um, yes. that's a, it's been a, a funny time for that because there are some, there are ways big and small, right? Like you got, there have been some examples of, um, of machine learning deployments, uh, looking at, at uh, trying to understand the virus um, makeup and trying to understand the distribution of the virus and things like that. And then I, I shared one today, I don't know if you saw on Twitter that uh, a Chrome extension called, um, what is it called, Netflix Party? Have you guys seen this? Oh, I, I did see something that. about that. Yeah. <laughs> so you can actually watch Netflix with friends. So uh, I expect that we'll be doing that, uh, both of you. <laughs> oh, totally. I, I'm actually, I'm writing an op-ed now about what, um, you know, studios and enter entertainment um, purveyors should do. Because what, um, what they've been doing has largely been mimicking the experiences that have worked in the past and just kind of enhancing them. So we still want you all to go to theaters. We're just going to pour a bunch of money into the in-theater experience so that that feels better. Instead of thinking through, you know, if we were designing this experience today, what would it look like? And my, my thesis is that if you were really designing a, an entertainment experience, movie entertainment experience from scratch today, it would look much more digital first. And so you would do, you know, for large releases like James Bond or Mulan or, or something like that, you would do a controlled drip so here's a few tickets that you buy to buy. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, you know, it starts at a certain kind of like paper reports, those levels, because we've seen that people are willing to pay for entertainment a pretty penny, as long as it's wrapped in some amount of exclusivity and there's something else that you're delivering in addition to sheer content. So I'm hoping that out of out of this we have a new wave of entertainment delivery and things like that you know like i would pay extra to be able to watch a movie with my friends and yeah. my friends are not not necessarily in the same location so maybe we can you know buy a private screening or something like that oh well, that's a great idea um and you know when you think about it like in new york two movie tickets and a popcorn that's like 50 60 bucks already no, so we're, no. we're demonstrating and that's not counting in like child care or other things transportation for, yeah. yeah so so the dinner a, beforehand a, exactly yeah, so so you know it's like oh it's just the price of a movie ticket well it's not it's it's a pretty significant expense for uh for many families and that's so, a hulu subscription for a month right there exactly <laughs> right <laughs> for a year yeah <laughs> right so, yeah uh, so, so those are the kinds of trade-offs that are going through the consumer's minds, but not so much on the studio innovation side. And, you know, they, there are on what they could do to test this out. And now would be the perfect time to test it out. For sure. And it reminds me, too, of, you know, in the music industry, they've been innovating around mm -hmm. that for a while. You've had, yeah. uh, you know, uh, releases that have been done 
with apps first or, you know, and kind of that, that packaging of the experience as opposed to always following the same distribution format because the distribution format has been imploded for long enough that everybody's been trying to innovate. But I think we had, we had the luxury of, um, of uh, being able to sort of rest on our laurels and still go to the movie theaters. And mm -hmm. maybe, maybe this is uh, what it takes to force us to be innovative in that space. So I look forward to reading that. That'll be a really interesting op-ed. I do too. Um, I'm going but, into keyboard cap mode. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same type <laughs> but, you know, if we're, if we're talking about privacy today, then yes. all of those things, I mean, you can go to the movie theater, you can pay cash, right? <laughs> you can pay cash, you can, you know, sort of be pretty anonymous. And you used to be able to go to a record store and buy a CD and be pretty anonymous. Now, when you download an app, you know, or, or log into your Netflix account, you realize that there's a new cost to mm -hmm. what it is that you're, and, and which, which may be okay for the convenience, um, as long as we understand, you know, what's being done with that information, and we're okay with what's being done with that information. Yeah, so, good pivot if, to privacy. Yay! No, <laughs> if, if, um, if, music, if the Music Biz Conference happens in seven and a half weeks, which I highly doubt, um, I'm supposed to be on a panel about uh, how record labels and artists um, can't, or sh should be able to get access to the data that Spotify is collecting and then what they should do with it. And I'm there to sort of burst everybody's bubble and... <laughs> <laughs> make everybody hate me but um yeah what, so it's all a trade-off what this what, era has really shown is that you can't be like a mom and pop shop when it comes to big data like mm -hmm. if i'm a you know this is why platforms like patreon and uh spotify and google and everything else like they they gain orders of magnitude power from the more data that they can process and connect and so, so as much as i would like to kind of own my own data footprint, it takes a lot of knowledge and understanding and a lot of effort to actually turn it into something useful. So I think that's one right. of the, the biggest barriers, not just to the you, practical use of data, but really to consumers understanding what the underlying value of the data set is. Because for any given consumer, taken on their own, the value monetarily isn't that high. But in aggregate, it becomes immense. And so I think that's really hard to process. And so these small trade-offs seem very small. Like, yeah, of course you can access my location. Who cares? Right. I'm getting extra utility from your app, et cetera. But as you give up more data, it compounds and you you don't really you you seize understanding the individual trade-offs completely. Even when you're, you know thinking about this more than, than most other people are. Yeah. And what I, what I find really interesting about your space, Anna, is that I've had a few clients who are, who are ad tech companies and the mm -hmm. big question has been, so like all these new privacy laws are saying, well, you have to tell, you have to give consumers notice about what you're collecting them about them and why you're using it. But that only really seems to apply to the consumer facing businesses. And ad tech companies are often five or six companies back in the stream of commerce with this data yeah. and who, and you know, you hear about these data breaches that happen with companies that we have never heard of, mm -hmm. much less knew that they had our data. And so I don't think that the, that the legislation as, um, as powerful of a tool as it can be against companies like Facebook, for example, um, is going to do a whole lot for consumers understanding or for, um, you know, even creating the obligation for companies to give that information to consumers when they're that far back in the chain. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how, I mean, we can, we can stop Facebook from selling our information, although at this point, for most of us, the cat's well and truly out of the bag. Um, you know, maybe it will matter, like, for the next generation. Um, but that's, that's been, like, the, the most frustrating point for me. Um, and I think, um, like, Kate, you're, I, I think that there's a lot that, that you could be doing, and I'm not telling you how to write, you know, how to like organize your your life goals or anything. But um, I got you know, a pretty clear the, calendar for the next yeah. couple of months. So. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> no. But I mean, with you know, with what you've what you've done in the space of sort of 
technology generally, um, that idea of, of the, the data mass that's been created and how that can be used in a way that's not so scary <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, more beneficial and um, more for consumers. I yeah, there's a lot to be said there. Well, that's a really good segue into the, the main article that I, I flagged for us to discuss, um, which is, you know, this idea of of the government, the U.S. government looking at um, at anonymized, potentially anonymized, aggregated uh, data from sources like Facebook and Google uh, to look at location data and be able to glean from that potentially uh, from infected individuals where their paths might have crossed with other people or what kind of patterns there might be to um, to the the kind of contagion mapping or you know who's who's been where and, and what sort of risks are, are associated with with different uh, pathing and so I wonder such thing as anonymous data well sure <laughs> sure so um, that that's one that's it. <laughs> So I think, yeah. you know, one of the things, I guess before we, we launch into that, I, I just wanted to ask, you know, so, so as I said earlier, I, it's been kind of my fascination for a while, for a long while, years and years, uh, the idea that, that with the right kind of mindset, with the right kind of training of corporations and with the right kind of regulations and the right kind of usage by people, tech could really be a force for good and can really improve people's lives and, uh, you know, improve humanity overall. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of caveats that I just said on the lineup <laughs> to that, like huge caveats, <laughs> lots to unpack there. But, uh, you know, as I watch this, I think, you know, that the theoretical idea of what is being proposed in this, in this whole government, Facebook, Google, location data tracking thing is, is, if you remove any uh, ill intent or authoritarian scope creep or any of that stuff from it, it sounds so good, right? It sounds like this could be such a great, you know, savings to humanity. It could potentially clue in uh, health, public health officials into where they need to be focused and could, could lead to all sorts of other discoveries too. So, so what are the things that we need to be thinking about here? What are the areas that we need to be concerned about uh, when it comes to this story at the highest level, e either one of you, uh, if you want to well, jump I'm going to have to go get another bottle of wine. Because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think that you have to start with the players because the, the federal government, as it stands right now, Facebook and Google are like the three parties that I least want having my location data. <laughs> right. And I mean, Facebook and Google are, I mean, it, they're on one side and the government's on the other. Facebook and Google are, um, well, I mean, they've both been horrible about privacy, right? I mean, we know whatever Facebook has about you, they're going to use for ill. Like, we know this. Like, so it's hard to separate that story from who it is that has the information. And I think that's why the knee-jerk reaction about it is so, like, hell no. Um, you know, when you start talking about the government having information, I mean, for one thing, there's not a privacy law like, you know, anywhere outside of basically the, you know, Fourth Amendment that says anything about what the government can do with your information. So, um, you know, none of the, like, GDPR doesn't apply to the government, obviously the CCPA, like, no federal law that, you know, if it actually comes into existence is going to apply to the government itself. Um, so we would need to hear... I mean, in order, I think, to get comfort around it, we would need to know that the information is being used for that purpose and only for that purpose, and that it's going to be somehow destroyed, you know, after that time. And that there's not going to be, the government's not going to suddenly turn that information over to the FBI and start letting them, you know, ha have a pattern already established for a particular, you know, IP address about where it's been and who its associates are. So, so the, the government oh, go might not, uh, you know, need that access because they can buy that from a commercial third party data provider, which is exactly what they've been. I as definitely a around need more beer. Yeah. Both. Uh -huh. Yeah. But, <laughs> I was going to say, this is, we should have gone to hard liquor right away. <laughs> Saint I figured we could always escalate. Yeah, but I, I think you're, you know, there, there's a, a couple of interesting threads in, <laughs> in, in there. And I, I think 
a lot of the uh, privacy and legislation conversation right now is so focused on digital data. And I think that's the wrong starting point. I think the, the starting point should be the consumer. And so why is it okay to purchase offline marketing data, for example, and really, really um, in-depth lists about behavior, demographic, psychographic, in some cases, who's taking which medication, and then you know, reach out to those people over direct mail, because this is somehow completely acceptable. And in, in my worldview, that's way worse than a digital fleeting digital ad you know these people now know where i live and they're sending me things to the address where i live like that to me is a bigger breach of privacy so i think we're we're looking at it very myopically at like oh this is a digital data problem that's almost originating with these three large platforms that are leading most of our conversations and i i would like to pull that back uh, a few decades to when we really started transacting with data without giving consumers the right to say no thank you um, it's insanely hard if uh, at all possible to opt out of credit monitoring in the united states and those are the first companies that i would like to have nothing to do with um, mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a consumer um, or at least have very tight control under which somebody can access my credit report uh, to the point where, you know, I want to establish some sort of monetary payment thing. Like if you want to look at my spending report, you can donate 50 bucks to a charity of my choice. And this is all automated through some magical platform that so far only exists in my head. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think it's interesting that we're having these conversations in a country that, that is so against the idea of like having a national ID for instance. And in effect, we not only have a national ID, we have a global ID, and that's everybody's Google login or Facebook ID, Facebook login, or even your cell phone number and your telecom, uh, just your telecom logs, which are uh, a, a data point that the government loves to access. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a case where tech has outpaced uh, certainly the public conversation, definitely any regulatory activity, but really the so far outpaced what consumers even think is possible that I think that a lot of these conversations that we're having now, especially on the ad tech side, when I raise things like, look, you go to some website because you've Googled some strange illness because you heard about it on, you know, on a program or somebody in your family has been diagnosed with it, et cetera. And somebody puts you in a segment that's as likely to have so-and-so condition or disease. And there's nothing you can do to remove yourself from that segment. And that segment, two, three years from now, can be purchased by a health insurer or a life insurance company without your knowledge and be fed into their black box algorithm to decide what type of coverage they give to you. And again, none of this is visible to you or to anyone else. There's no audit trail. There's no, it's just, here's the price that we decided for your coverage, or here's, sorry, we can't grant you coverage. Good luck with somebody else. And so it's a very one-sided conversation. And I realize that to people who don't spend their time in the weeds of this data, this sounds probably nuts, but it's not. No. <laughs> No, it's not. No. <clears throat> no, and I think that you think you're right. I remember growing up, like learning the idea. At some point, I, I was in maybe my teenage years or something, and, and learning the idea that uh, there was there was a movement, and and Ralph Nader was a big proponent. I remember <laughs> of the idea that you didn't have to use your social security number as ID. You didn't have mm -hmm. to give over your social security number, and yeah. I remember thinking, oh, how come nobody told me this when I was given my social security number? Yeah. And then as I went through, I think like through college, I remember trying to withhold mm -hmm. that and trying to, you know, fill out forms and then leave yeah. that blank and then argue with the person who was collecting the form whenever they insisted yeah. that I give them my social security number. And like yeah. kind of it, it ending up being fruitless because, you know, there's just too much bureaucracy. It was too <clears throat> set in place. And not and, enough people understood yeah. that that was supposed to be something that you could withhold. And here we are, I think, yeah. Anna, you explained it so beautifully, like there's, there's this whole infrastructure that has completely sidestepped the issue of whether you want that information to be collected. It just is. 
And, and yeah. if you participate in any contemporary way in what, what the, the modern conveniences of, of life, you know, especially mm -hmm. now as we're all confined to the internet, yes. <laughs> you know, we're, <laughs> we're moving about in ways that, yeah. <laughs> can, can I make a quick point though about, yeah, about the social security numbers, which it mm -hmm. just, um, so I'm reading a book right now by a Vanderbilt professor named Sarah Ego um, called The Known Citizen. And she traces sort of all of the, um, debates that have gone on in essentially human history about privacy and social security numbers were a huge one. Really? Like, yeah. Nobody yeah. wanted them when they first came mm -hmm. out in the thirties, I think it was like, mm -hmm. it was a, it was a major undertaking to get people to agree to the idea that they would somehow be identified by a number that would track them mm -hmm. everywhere they went. And if they had had Zoom, they would be have been having this exact same conversation yeah, there, about whether there was or not a, they should even be given a social security There was number. a 1930s equivalent of Tara, Era, Anna, and Kate <laughs> yeah. having this yeah. conversation yeah. somewhere in some kitchen over yeah. wine, no yes. doubt. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I, I think we probably had more elaborate hats then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I want them those hats it'd be really fun on a zoom call we should so, do these uh with like you know topical decades so we get to yeah. dress up and then <laughs> travel through time in privacy i yeah, like I, it i love I, it i, I will love send it. you all copies of this book so you can <laughs> yes so I, I i vividly remember that ralph nader push to kind of you know educate people about uh, why this isn't really your 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 id and i think without realizing it, the new social security number, how uh, our cell phone number has become that. Because with no thinking at all, think of all the ways, all the places where you've randomly left your cell phone number over the yeah. last decade. And that one identifier can connect so many different data sets relatively easily. Uh, and again, it's, it's not, if you look at, you know, the JCPenney credit card that you signed up for, I don't know, seven years ago, probably you weren't thinking it just, you know, mechanically gave your cell phone number at that time. Yeah, but especially if you were be... signing up for a JCPenney credit card seven years ago. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, I mean, but there's so many individual transactions like that that just seem completely innocuous and irrelevant. And unless you are interpreted as being hyper paranoid to think of having like a throwaway cell phone number that you can provide yeah. to all those kinds of things that ship has sailed right because yeah, right. those records you've already done it yeah yes you know, and, no and one, those no one reasonable would do that no <laughs> <laughs> what i kind of want to know though i mean because of course you know i gave my social security number to you know my college when mm -hmm. when i started and all the why did they need it and what did they do with it I mean, I was an eight, like what, what mm -hmm. benefit was it to them of getting my social security number? I was 18 years old. Like there's no, yeah. you know, they're not writing credit checks on me. You know, well, well, this, this digs into, this well, digs into, I, mean, maybe a, they are, um, I don't know, but like, this digs into a related topic that I often talk about with my audiences, my keynote audiences, especially corporate leadership is that there's this way in which, uh, you know, there's, there tends to be an accumulation of all the information that someone thinks could be interesting and relevant and could someday be necessary in order to perform some, you know, sort of adjacent task to whatever the, the, the main use case is. And those become the, the, the codified form requirements and they become what becomes part of the, the um, institutional knowledge, but not necessary parts of institutional knowledge. Like people are gathering far more information than they need about their constituents because someone somewhere along the way thought, well, you know, we're Uber, we could really use battery level on the people who are signifying that they need a ride, right? Like there's, there's yeah. so many of those types of things that just kind of make their way into the, the sort of pocket of information that gets collected and then they never stop. And I think that happens, I saw it happen in large organizations over my career with so many kinds of things like arcane little pieces of data that were collected in one sort of paper form. And when they started digitizing all of that, they were like, oh, well, we have to collect all of these pieces of data because we always have. And we, we want to make sure we have continuity of all this data. I'm like, you don't need it. You never use it. You're not basing any of your critical decisions off of any of this data. It doesn't make any sense. They're like, but that's how it's always been done. 
<laughs> so yeah, I suspect I, it's that. I will say that the laws are are trying to address that. So mm -hmm. the one one of the common threads through both the GDPR and then the state laws in the United States are is data minimization. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, two things: data minimization, and then also stating what your purpose for collecting the information is. So if you can't state it, you can't use it for that unless you go back to the the customer and get their consent again for whatever new purpose it is. Um, so theoretically, um, these kinds of that that kind of sort of over collection mm -hmm. is is going to go away um, as 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 the not only the laws but sort of the um, I mean I think the laws are are meant for enforcement but they're also meant to start to change the conversation and change mm -hmm. the philosophy. There, yeah. There's a beautiful loophole here though. Um, which I see so easily um, exploitable, and that's uh, there's source data is one thing, but then derived data is, gives you additional freedom to misinterpret, kind of. So I can use that data point and shove it into some ML AI processing engine and and label it something different, and that kind of suspends. At least from a from a legally enforceable perspective, mm -hmm. uh, that um, regulatory requirement, especially if I'm using it for internal purposes. So if I'm a telco, I can use it to you know throttle somebody's um, data allowance up or down or things like that. I don't actually have to take action on it and and you know push it out somewhere. And that's a that's a pretty giant loophole, <laughs> and I think it has to do with again the the pace of technology, definitely outpacing the regulatory uh, environment, but really outpacing what uh, users uh, perceive here as, uh, as 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 being relevant to them or potentially you know something that they may object to if they understood better. So we have a. Uh less than 10 minutes left of the uh, oh, okay. allocated time for yeah. um, for my Zoom call uh, window. And, and so everyone in the world is using Zoom right now, so we yeah, won't Yeah, so I want to come back to um, this issue of the, the location data and mm -hmm. the government's use of it for what potentially could be public health considerations. So is there a safe way or a good way for this kind of transaction to happen in, in either of your views? Is there a, a way that you... Um, if you were being called upon to advise the government in this moment, would advise them to proceed so that they could use some kind of data that might inform some kind of public health overview and, and, and what, what would that be in, in the, to the best of your ability to, to capture it? So I, I think, I'm going to go, oh, okay, I, I'm going to go first go because I think my answer is going to be yeah. shorter because you're the bigger thinker between the two of us. So um, I mean, as the privacy lawyer is sort of like the compliance person, right? Um, I would tell, I would tell the government that they, um, they, they can do this um, if they make it clear to the consumers what it is that they're doing. Um, and if, you know, some sort of a notice shows up on the phones that are being tracked and why they're being tracked. And if they, you know, assure that the data is being used for that purpose, um, and I'm not saying that it has to work necessarily in order to bring coronavirus down, but that they're using it for the purpose that they tell people that they're using it for and that they get rid of it when they're done with it, mm -hmm. when the crisis is over. That's what I would tell them to do. Yeah, I don't Lovely. believe they're going to do any of those things, but that's what I would tell them to do. <laughs> <You're Tarana. laughs> I, I, I agree. I think the, the question is which government, because yeah. if it's the United States government, I would say the level of trust that should be placed, not just in the current government, but in general, is very low. But we have seen very good implementations of this, in, uh, for example, in Singapore and in South Korea, where it's very clear what is being collected, for how long, how it's going to be used, and that the primary and really only use case for this information is for public health uh, reasons, and it's worked really well. So, you know, for something like that, where there is a, a clear mandate and, you know, responsible people are in charge of implementing it, I think this is a, a beautiful, easy solution that can really save lives and accelerate finding people who are truly at risk and who, you know, might not be aware that they need to just 
you know, lock themselves up for a couple of weeks so that other people aren't affected, even if they personally aren't suffering. But I, I don't, it's one of those things that I think is very uh, precarious to even try to implement in the United States, which is why as excited as I am about the possibility of the, you know, digital data being used in this way to prevent a pandemic, I place zero trust in the powers that be here to actually use it and deploy it in a responsible way and in a way that doesn't ultimately somehow damage the consumer who may be walking into this with the same kind of, well, if it's for public health, of course, I'll, I'll use this or I'll volunteer this information. And it's that degree of trust that I think is key here and it's key for consumers to understand who they're fine to have their data and who they don't trust with their data and that's really what we don't have as an option today. Yeah because I, I would also tell I'm oh, sorry I would also tell the government that they to make sure that they keep their partners accountable so mm -hmm. Google doesn't get to run off and do you know create a health database with it yeah. and Facebook yeah so that it, everyone who has touched it and has had access to it needs to delete that access and destroy their information at the end of of the project yeah and and i think what both of you have said is so right on and i think one of the only other things that occurs to me is is um you know we're in a mo we're in a moment in time where the realities uh are dawning upon people you know, hour by hour and day by day. And so every bit yeah. of this is subject to change so rapidly. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm concerned that what seems necessary now and, and what, what seems like a reasonable boundary to put upon what's necessary is not going to seem reasonable in a week when, you know, things are well beyond where they are. And uh, it, it seems like that's justification for overreaching what we agreed were were the limits then so we're talking about within what's been proposed so far there's this third of a mile limit to the data and how it would be you know in terms of its um anonymization and aggregation and and i think that sounds very very reasonable if all you're looking for patterns are, are patterns of who was in you know houston uh then and is in new york now like i was a few weeks ago um but but if you're if you then a week from now are saying we're so far past that point that we need to break this down further and now that we have this data connection already <laughs> you know why don't we just go ahead and, and dig a little deeper because that will tell us yeah. everything we need to know that that's the that's one of the fears i have so i think somehow being able to lock in place some with some uh certainty the, the regulation and the scope the, in the scope of that and protections uh, for for people to to protect everything that you two articulated so beautifully that that I think is important. You bring up a really good point um, that you know if this thing goes completely haywire in a week, we may not want the government to tell us no, we can't do that because privacy, right? We might want to say take all of my information, yeah. just save me, right? I mean, tell me which one, or worse yet, tell me which one of my neighbors has it. Like that, you yeah. know, there there may be a point where the where the consumers at large are so desperate for information that privacy goes out the window. And I've had this conversation with friends of mine who've cared for sick relatives and people who were homebound somewhere else and they talk about how like they don't want to hear anything about you know the privacy concerns about the um the ring camera system for example mm. because it helped them take care of their relatives and no you know in a situation like that nobody cares about privacy and i don't think that's unreasonable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so yeah this is all about you know sort of gauging where consumers are and um, right now that's going to go up and down you know like crazy so yeah it, it, it's not the the use at time of crisis it's the what happens after and mm -hmm. every precedent exactly. we've seen during our lifetimes and possibly not possibly definitely earlier has once you move that border it doesn't come back so right. there's no yeah. okay we've suffered a terrible crisis terrorist attack etc we we got this, now let's move back things to a reasonable place. That yeah. never happens. That's right. So I, I think this is what we're looking at now and why you know the three of us and many other people are raising this flag now is because we see that pattern. We know what's gonna happen if that border gets pushed. 
that there's no bringing it back and there's no putting the genie back in the proverbial bottle. And I, I think that's the biggest concern for, for everybody here. And the reason why we'll probably be labeled as being a little bit paranoid until uh, everybody kind of realizes. Not about the virus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, yeah. wait a minute. I don't yeah. like this world. Help. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, should we let Kate wrap it up since we're down to less than a minute? Yeah, we're down to less than a minute. And I just want to thank you three, uh, uh, the three of us, you two, for being here. Uh, I'm cat enough to drink that now I'm miscounting. There, it seems like there's three of us in there. I know. Um, I didn't even get through a whole beer. Like, we got to drink faster I'm, next I'm, time. I'm doing well. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank so. you very much. And thanks to everybody. You know, once this is shared, I, I want to uh, appreciate everyone who's uh, watching and thinking about these issues issues perhaps for uh, at new levels that you've never really considered and, and thank you to Tara thank you to Anna um, and uh, Thanks, I Kate. think we'll thank you and I think we'll do more of these and I appreciate you Yay. two being uh, willing to be <laughs> guinea pigs on, on our first go around here so cheers. cheers cheers here's to the here's to human overcoming of whatever faces us <laughs> yay yay to that all right <laughs> bye everybody bye bye